Since the earliest moments of civilization, the process of discovery has driven all human progress. Knowledge builds upon knowledge to increase the pace of discovery. Scientific, creative, and commercial breakthroughs are the product of a global learning process that combines new experiences and interactions with the learnings we have gained from the past. Discovery then leads to automation, from manufacturing to healthcare to transportation to communication. Well understood discoveries have been automated, computerized, revolutionizing every aspect of how we live our lives. Once a task is automated, we can stop thinking about it, freeing us to make new discoveries and accelerating ever so slightly the slow, human-bound discovery process. What if we could automate discovery itself? Self-discovering computers can fundamentally improve our way of life by solving hard problems we have been struggling with for decades. Cancer and disease will be a thing of the past. Energy will be abundant and clean. Agriculture will be revolutionized. Computers will even be able to discover entirely new fields of math and science, taking us beyond what we are able to imagine today. When imagining the future, it is always helpful to look back. Biological evolution, the original discovery mechanism, takes millions of years to discover new, useful abilities and adapt the genetic code to take advantage of them. The human mind accelerates that process tremendously. We invented language as a way to communicate ideas and writing as a way to preserve them for future generations. We invented computers and data storage systems and the internet to further accelerate the process of remembering and sharing ideas. But still, only a few people from each generation truly advance humanity by generating new ideas and discoveries ultimately becoming the bottleneck in our quest to fully understand the natural world. This is why AI is so exciting. What if we could recreate the entire history of human discovery in a machine? What if we could fast forward that process into the future and have these systems make discoveries, not every 30 years, but every 30 seconds? Hi, Max. You've been actively involved in AI for some time now, and in your book, you also talk about how AI can change the future around climate and things like poverty and healthcare. How do you see AI and its role in changing our future? This is a really exciting time. You know, people have realized for basically as long as they've walked the earth, right, that intelligence has been the key to shaping our own destiny. And, and for, for most of human history, we were just running around trying to not starve to death and not get eaten, basically. And then gradually, because of science and tech, we, we, the things we were able to figure out with our intelligence, we were able to become more and more masters of our own destiny. We've more than doubled our life expectancy yes. because of human intelligence. But there's a lot of problems that we're still stumped by. Uh, so to me, it's inc incredibly exciting this possibility that we might be able to amplify our intelligence with artificial intelligence and solve all those other problems too. You mentioned healthcare. Obviously, if we're told that a loved one has an uncurable cancer, it's not true that it's uncurable. It just means we haven't had the intelligence yet to figure out how to cure it. Of course, it's physically possible to solve our climate challenge and lift everybody out of poverty and do so many other things people have dreamt about. So this is a super exciting time, and, and, and not just because it's theoretically possible, but because it's really happening. The progress in just the last few years has been breathtaking. You're a physicist. Do you think we understand the physics of the human brain? Do we have the tools that allow us to see everything that's in there? Or is there something in it, maybe quantum mechanical, maybe otherwise, that we can't really see? Oh, that's a great question. I'm actually both a physicist and also an AI researcher, since that's what I spent my last seven years working yes. on with my MIT groups. I think it's pretty clear that you do not need any quantum effects to build superhuman AI. There's nothing quantum at all about GPT-4, and there's no indication that our neurons in our head critically use quantum effects either that it's necessary 
for you to be so smart. There's this idea of substrate independence, which is it's very powerful, which in plain English just means that intelligence is all about information processing. It's not something mysterious intelligence that can only exist inside of human brains. It doesn't matter whether the information is processed by a carbon atom in a neuron in a brain or by a silicon atom in some sort of other device. It's the structure of the information processing that matters, nothing else. And that means that we've repeatedly been able to completely swap out the hardware. Now it's CPUs, now it's GPUs, now it's this kind of, of memory, and now it's a hard drive of magnetism, and now it's flash RAM. You know, from the perspective of the programmer, you don't even care. Yes. Right? It's the, the, as long as the information away. processing is the same. So you can actually abstract away a lot of the physics. Yeah. That's the beauty of it, right? Which means that there is a real hope for understanding intelligence quite deeply, even without understanding exactly why we have so many different kinds of neurons in our head and so on, because that's just part of the substrate. One of the reasons why AI has advanced so fast recently, of course, has been that we have so much more data now to train our models on. I'm curious, can you say a little bit more about what you're doing now with various customers on the AI side? Zoom is an all-in-one collaboration platform. The mission is to connect people and make people more productive. AI plays a major role in that. My name is Vijay Parthasaradi. I'm the head of AI here at Zoom. Zoom started as a video communication product and we are transforming into a communication platform. We are always about reducing the friction in communication, which also means solving all kinds of ways people communicate. AI is a big priority for us here at Zoom. We started with virtual background, audio processing, to speech to text, and now on large language models, national language understanding. We also build multimodal solutions. So we work with VAST on training of these AI ML models. We have a large GPU cluster. There are hundreds of experiments which are executed on them. We wanted to feed the data to these GPUs as fast as possible, so there is no delay. We are very deliberate in removing roadblocks for our researchers because the productivity of those engineers rely on these workloads to run efficiently and also reliably. WAS as a platform helps us both scale and also be more reliable in running these jobs. When you're running many experiments all together, there is a lot of artifacts which are created. The model creates artifact, you need multiple different data sets and you need to slice and dice the data in different ways. Their flexible dashboard helps us visualize what is being stored and how we can actually manage our storage. For a frictionless communication, we need to build AI models, not just on video or audio or text. We have to build models across all of them. And Vast Data Platform helps us build those models more efficiently. Automation is the key. And with Vast Data Platform, we'll be able to build beyond the capabilities which we have already built and help our mission towards connecting people and making them more productive. With Vast Data Platform, the future is bright. In 2019, we launched the company and introduced the concept of universal storage, an idea that by designing a new architecture, we can break the fundamental trade-offs that have plagued infrastructure for many decades. We can eliminate the compromise between scale, performance, cost, resilience, and ease of use. Four years later, we're proud to have the most data-intensive organizations in the world as our customers. They have selected VAST software to manage over 10 exabytes of data across six continents. VAST is now the fastest growing infrastructure company in history and has captured the attention of world-leading partners, thought leaders, and investors. As our customers embarked on the adventure of building large-scale AI clusters, they asked us to extend this new architecture to the world of databases 
to the world of compute engines across public cloud, private cloud, edge, and device. They want the freedom to reimagine their interaction with data in this new AI era without being confined to constraints of the past. Customers like Pixar. At Pixar, our mission is to make stories that entertain. So our focus is on creating world-class animation that's unique and forwards the story. Pixar has been doing animation as a company since 1995, when our first feature film came out, Toy Story. And we've been pretty much creating an animated feature every year since then. Check this out. Our latest feature is Elemental, which will be our 27th film. We run a little hot. One of the important things to realize is that it's the story and the animation that dictates our pace of innovation here at Pixar. We have some of the most talented storytellers in the world, and they come up with concepts that nobody's ever thought of. And so our technology needs will be dependent on what this story is calling for. In 2018, we first met with Vast. There was a movie coming out called Soul, in which some of the characters were what we call volumetric characters. In other words, they weren't traditional models. Instead, they were simulations. This was pretty problematic for us, mainly because what we call file caching. If you have, say, Woody in a shot, and you have Buzz in a shot, they're a model, and then they have some texture on it, and they're in every single shot. The model and the texture does not change. However, with volumetric characters, it's a simulation. Each frame of each character is independent and different from the one before it. So our traditional methods weren't gonna work. Come on, guys, we all knew this day was coming. We had to come up with a new solution that allowed us to have high-speed flash access to our data. And Vast had this great proposition that allowed us to get the performance we needed and the capacities we needed in order to support this new volumetric pipeline. It worked out so good that production then came to us before the end of Seoul and said, hey, we have this other idea. It's gonna be like Seoul, but it's gonna be three times bigger. Can we do it? Without hesitation, I said, yeah, we could do it. We got the technology now, we can scale it. It's not a matter of implementing something new, it's just a matter of making it bigger. We proceeded to work with our production teams and work with Vast and built a bigger cluster. Now we were able to render all of Elemental's characters. They also wanted some set pieces to be volumetric. They were wrong, though, in that they said it would be three times bigger than Seoul, and it ended up being six times bigger than Seoul. At the end of the day, the vast system came through. You see? He likes it. <laughs> we had 160,000 render cores hitting against it all at once, and the system worked flawlessly. VAST is allowing us to put all of our rendered assets on this one cluster of storage. And it offers us the ability to use these petabytes of data as training data for future AIs. We have already moved all our denoising data and finals and takes data set into the VAST cluster, specifically because of the potential AI might have in the future. When I met with the founders of Vast that first time, I was blown away by how they had not only the answers to how they were gonna fix all our problems, but they actually understood the engineering required to fix those problems. It's been fantastic working with Vast over these last four years. <laughs> we did it, we did it. <laughs> the Vast platform has allowed us to build beyond our current level of animation into future levels of animation that nobody's even thought of. To infinity and beyond! Today, we're proud to unveil the vision we've been engineering towards since the first days of VAST and introduce the VAST data platform. This platform includes the VAST data store, our unstructured storage system. It also includes the VAST database for structured data and the VAST data engine, our compute framework. All three parts stretch across geographies as part of one global namespace, the VAST data space. This new data platform was designed for the deep learning era to scale up 
to levels natural data requires, pictures, genomes, video, sound, and to enable machines to understand and generate insight and discoveries from these vast data sets. This vertically integrated software stack is built upon our unique DAYS architecture, continually taking advantage of the latest and greatest in hardware technologies while providing the easiest APIs up to the application. When looking back at the vast data store, at the core of our architecture were two main structures, the element store and the write buffer. Historically, the element store contained elements representing files and objects, unstructured data, and the write buffer was a queue of new data flowing into the system, which triggered internal functions, data placement, data protection, data reduction, encryption, to process that information for storage purposes. To introduce our new vast database, we must add a new type of element, the table, as well as a new protocol, standard query language. Files and objects have metadata, type, size, access pattern, permissions. We can now run SQL queries on this metadata, asking for the files larger than a certain size that belong to a certain user and haven't been touched recently. A picture will have application-specific contextual metadata, resolution, time it was taken, location it was taken, camera. As it runs through an inference function, more metadata is added. What is it a picture of? Who is in it? Etc. Now we can ask higher level queries, like where a certain person was on a certain date. By cross-correlating facial recognition and the time and place a picture was taken, we can easily answer that. Cross-correlating many different feeds, satellite imagery, genomes, video feeds, tray data, allows us to generate higher and higher levels of understanding while building a more accurate view of the underlying natural world, bridging the gap between unstructured and structured data. This new database spans beyond the ability to just query metadata. One element store now combines the concepts of file system and database. You can, for example, store parquet data using S3 and then query it natively using SQL. As we go up the stack, we find more and more trade-offs to be broken. For example, when the data is stored on random access media, there is no need for separate transactional row-based and analytics column-based copies with complex ETLs in between. Computing has always been defined by the dichotomy of space and time. Memory and logic have been the foundation of computational systems, ranging from the Turing machine all the way to object-oriented programming models. In the same way that the vast database allowed application-level metadata to be queried, the vast data engine allows application-level functions to be triggered, bringing the platform to life. Leveraging our write buffer queue, we will now introduce two new types of elements, triggers and functions. A trigger may be on new file. As a new file comes in, you can run it through an inference function or a training function or both. You can further filter triggers based on metadata. For example, only files of type picture taken in the United States in 2023. When running a picture through an inference function, new understandings emerge, which are placed in the vast database. These additions can trigger new functions recursively. For example, on new record with a filter of a specific individual recognized in a specific location. Since a function is an element like any other, we can also trigger actions upon function changes. For example, if a training function generated a new, more accurate AI model that modifies the associated inference function, we now want to re-infer all the historical data. On function change, rerun the function on all the data it was run on previously. Lastly, a function's metadata can indicate where it should run, on a CPU or a GPU, and when 
its priority, and expected runtime. All this will be considered when scheduling it across time and space. When we say space, we mean geographical space. All three parts of the vast data platform are geographically distributed as part of one global namespace. The vast data space spans public cloud, private cloud, edge, and device. It allows you to write to anywhere and read from anywhere, providing globally consistent data access. We can even break the speed of light by scheduling functions to run adjacent to their data. The result is a global perpetual learning machine that takes unstructured natural data as input and through a recursive loop of continuous data-driven actions creates structure and provides insight and discoveries as output. No longer should applications read and write from a storage system or a database, but rather the data itself shall trigger functions that run on data and manipulate it in a recursive manner. Data preparation, data cleaning, data anonymization, data inference, data training, data is now at the center. The vast data platform allows data developers to focus on their application, not needing to think about the underlying infrastructure. All this without compromising on the highest levels of performance, scale, and resilience across all clouds in a very easy to use platform. Jeff will now take us one level deeper and talk about how it all works. Okay, get ready because we have a lot to cover. Now to start, architecture is really everything at VAST because it's basically impossible to change the nature of computing if you're stuck building on legacy infrastructure concepts. And that's why in 2019, we unveiled a new approach to building scalable systems that's really the foundation for everything that we do. And we call this DAIS, which stands for our disaggregated and shared everything architecture. DAIS starts by revisiting the core building block of conventional scalable systems, the server, yesterday's scale-out architectures combine state and logic into a single machine, and then distributed systems are built by clustering these machines together using data partitioning. And partitioning just creates a ton of problems at scale, like managing global metadata, managing transactional consistency, caching, dealing with server failures. All of this creates crosstalk, and crosstalk leads to serialization. Serialization leads to scaling bottlenecks, and bottlenecks don't work for AI supercomputers. And so to solve for this, we needed to basically turn cloud-scale infrastructure inside out. Day's architecture is a fundamentally new approach to both computing and storage that begins with decoupling the system's logic, or the processing layer, from the system's state, or the data. Day's then creates massively scalable clusters of processors and SSDs by interconnecting them over a shared low latency data center fabric. But the invention here is not just some new topology. The core vast invention is that in our day's architecture, we've invented a new shared transactional data structure. And this is designed for data consistency and integrity, all while making data accessible from all of the containers in parallel. And so by eliminating the idea of exclusive ownership of any one machine, and then building ACID semantics all the way down to the data itself, None of the containers need to coordinate with each other at all. And if you think about it, the day's architecture abstracts the classic state and logic computing paradigm all the way to data center scale, where each core of the platform now enjoys direct access to both short-term and to long-term persistent memory spaces and can manipulate data as a multi-core parallel computer. The key is there is zero east-west traffic in the read or write path, and that makes it transactionally consistent while also being limitless in both performance and capacity scale. So the data layer of the system is called the element store, and each piece of data in the platform is considered an element. And since every container can see all of the system's data, the metadata, the indexes, the functions, the events, the architecture resolves problems of computational scale by allowing the system's functions to all operate in parallel. They can scale linearly and get faster as you add CPUs, GPUs, and SSDs. And then at the storage layer, the system implements a non-volatile write buffer. It's made of low latency persistent memory, and their data is streamed, captured, processed, and manipulated in before it's stored in long-term, low-cost flash storage. And that write buffer allows us to transform data in real time while doing some really, really interesting things, 
like extending the lifespan of cheap flash by ordering writes before they're stored into long-term storage, like rearranging database records into columnar objects that are optimized for fast queries, like implementing a breakthrough approach to global data compression so we can achieve archive economics with Flash. And then finally, to create and manage consistent snapshots at any level of scale. All of this with the intention of simplifying data management and making infrastructure ultimately efficient. Once your archive is built from Flash, there's really no need for any faster tier of storage in your environment. We've basically broken the trade-off between capacity and performance, so you can use random access storage for all of your capacity. So why is random access important at scale? Well, if you think about deep learning, it's essentially applied statistics, and statistical models improve as they're exposed to more and more quality data. It makes sense. If you want to teach a car how to drive, show it every possible training scenario. Random access all the way down to the archive is critical as we graduate to the next wave of AI training. And that's where domain-specific AI models will be trained not against some generic Twitter data set, but against all of your confidential and domain-specific data assets. And so all Flash basically becomes this insurance policy that you can bet on, and it eliminates constraints around your data so that you can now process on all of the data that you've accumulated over time. Okay. So now let's talk about data presentation. The data foundation of the system is what we call the vast data store. And unlike conventional business reporting systems that are designed to process ordered data that lives in numbers and tables, we humans learn by processing data that has no predefined structure. Data just comes to our senses from the natural world, sight, sound, touch, and so on. And just as our brains spend most of their time processing this data with our neural networks, Unstructured natural data now represents the majority of the digital data that we create in the world. So text, imagery, video, and instrument data is now the basis for all modern forms of deep learning. And so the vast data store is really a multi-protocol unstructured data storage platform that embraces standard enterprise NAS protocols. But we've turned performance levels up to what was previously only possible with HPC parallel file systems. Here again, the DAYS architecture is what really makes it possible to tackle the hardest parallel I.O. challenges. First, we've eliminated any cross-cluster cache coherency, metadata, or locking traffic. And that's what makes it possible to use standard NFS for parallel I.O., for HPC, and even AI workloads. Now, the system's parallel SMB server can feed farms of Windows and Mac systems while delivering unprecedented levels of resilience. And our object storage access is just as fast as our file access. Finally, our new groundbreaking similarity-based data reduction pays dividends across all the applications that we support. But it even makes it possible to run data protection and ransomware recovery applications as just another workload on one scalable and affordable tier of Flash. Now, you might wonder why standards are such a critical aspect of our strategy. And it's because we're building systems that can allow enterprise IT teams to keep their standard access protocols that their applications have become accustomed to over time. And that makes it easy to bring AI to your data as opposed to bringing your data to some exotic AI storage. Now, finally, the vast data store is built with enterprise-grade security and data management features that have allowed our data platform to become the trusted system of record for both large enterprises as well as multi-tenant cloud service providers. Here. We think we've broken the trade-off that exists between scale and simplicity, where you can now get an enterprise product experience, but it can scale all the way to hyperscale proportions. IDC calls days the architecture of the future, and exabytes of the vast data store are already used to power some of the world's most data-intensive workflows, such as at the Allen Institute, who's pioneering new fields of brain research in Seattle, Washington. The Allen Institute is all about fundamental discoveries in life sciences and accelerating scientific research around the world. We care deeply about open science and we really want to make our data and our tools available to users as quickly as we can. The Allen Institute is a really awesome place to work because we're able to pursue high impact questions in a completely open way where we can share our data with the entire neuroscience community. At the Allen Institute for Neurodynamics, we are interested in mapping brain-wide neural circuits. 
By understanding how different brain regions are connected, we can then start to understand why the brain is not functioning correctly in diseases such as Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. And if we're able to understand that, then we may be able to develop therapeutics or drugs to cure those diseases. When we collect our raw data, you can think of it as a panorama across the brain. The first step is that the data has to all be stitched and put back together. The data then needs to be traced and segmented. We need to find out where these neurons are. The data that we collect is gigantic. The files that we collect are hundreds of terabytes over a day or two, and everything changes about how you need to manage data when it's that big and that fast. The challenges are all about scale. There's just the size of the data that we collect and how fast we collect it. We're excited to work with VAST because it really is all about performance. The VAST data system was really unique in its capability to both take in the data at the rate that we needed, but also to store these several hundred terabyte data sets. It allowed us to run our microscopes 24-7, essentially, collecting as much data as possible so ultimately we could map as many neural circuits as possible. Every step of the way, we keep track of the code that was run, the version that was run, all the parameters of all those steps, those get stored in little files that follow every result out the door. The metadata that we need to keep track of in order to understand how to effectively and reproducibly analyze our data is just really complicated, and our understanding of it changes over time. We can quickly become drowning in the data in terms of how to analyze it. All of the new advancements in machine learning and AI are really going to be pivotal in allowing us to make sense of all of the data. For example, in mapping brain-wide neural circuits, being able to trace them and sort of segment them across the brain is extremely laborious to do by hand. Being able to use automatic triggering of processes for our data is very important. The rate at which we can analyze these neurons is going to be sped up dramatically. I think another big part of this platform is mechanisms for collaboration. Our vision for a data platform is one where anybody can come to the platform and have immediate access to data and run their own analysis on it and even rerun the ones that we already ran and then use that information as platform to create their own discoveries. Academic research is often insular. Some of that is cultural, some of that is technical. Any type of user that's interested in coming to the platform can come and play and get compute and work with the data. So we're excited for a platform that makes it possible to really rapidly share data around the world with everybody. Okay, so let's talk about data gravity. It's really easy to move code across data centers and back and forth between clouds. Now it's much harder to bring the data to the application but if you're going to build a global computer, you really need to solve for global data access. The challenge with building something for multi-cloud has always been the transactional performance that applications get at the edge. Any site that doesn't own the data ultimately has to coordinate with some other remote data owner. And that happens at the speed of a wide area network, which isn't fast enough for global AI. And so basically we needed to break the trade-off between data consistency and performance at a global scale. And for this reason, we built the vast data space. The data space is an altogether new approach to marrying performance and consistency so that you can get high performance access to your data from anywhere. And we started by borrowing from some ideas that were popularized with Web3 computing. And so your data is no longer centrally locked by a data owner. Locking becomes decentralized across the data space and locks essentially will flow to the data updates that happen across the namespace. And by delegating locks to a remote site, a data owner, in essence, is providing a lease to some application that wants to add, remove, or change data across the namespace. But then we take locking all the way down to the element level. And so whether you're talking about a file, an object, a database record, or even a piece of code, any changes to data happen at a level of granularity that's so small, any other data in a directory or a bucket or a table is totally unaffected by this. Next, the data space implements a global buffer across every site that you use to build a cluster. And so applications can enjoy accelerated reads and writes all the way to the edge. We've created a sync policy that proactively will synchronize data to some new remote cache if you want to make sure that the data is where you want to compute when you're ready to compute. Or you can let your users lazily access data when you don't want to pre-fill some remote edge cache. Even in the case of a lazy data retrieval, 
we've built these new intelligent prefetch algorithms that work to ensure that your pipes are always full. And so finally, the system's designed to listen. So if you have a job scheduler or an orchestration platform that can provide the system hints about future data access, well, the data space will proactively warm a remote cache so that there's no wait time when you schedule a computing job at a location which is remote to your data. It's really ideal for burst computing into the cloud, which brings me to cloud. We're most excited to announce that the vast data space now extends vast clusters into leading public cloud platforms, such as AWS, Google, and Microsoft. Okay, so now we've laid the storage foundation for data from the natural world that can extend access all around the world. Let's talk about structure. So I'll tell you a secret. If you've been following us for some time, you might have read the Vast Data White Paper. The paper basically reads as a description of a modern storage architecture. But if you took a closer look, you would have seen that it's really a blueprint. A blueprint for a massively scalable and acid transactional key value store that we just chose to expose with file protocols in the early days. Now, I mentioned earlier that the day's architecture creates a distributed system that eliminates the need for partitioning to get to scale. And that is a huge step forward for databases. But it also supports the ability to serve and process data via multiple data presentations. And so now let's come back to structure. If you think about AI environments, they're not just built for unstructured data. They also require things like data catalogs and feature stores to create a semantic understanding of your unstructured data. Until now, we've had to stitch together a bunch of different systems of record just to organize and process on data. You've got file systems, you've got object stores, databases, data lakes. It's a lot of stuff. And that file data then gets recorded using databases. And maybe some data streaming engines also are in the mix. And then these records then get transformed into some analytical data and that gets shipped into some data warehouse and ultimately, it's finally possible to go query upon, but that's really just a mess. So we asked ourselves a few questions in the early days. We said, first, why can't there be a system that combines the transactional performance of a database with the analytical performance of a data warehouse? Ultimately, what we want to do is stream and query on data in place. And then why do databases need to be distinct from the files and the objects that they're being used to catalog? And so as we thought further about this new era of AI discovery, what we realize is that the awesome power of AI will be to create structure on top of unstructured data so that humans and machines can understand data by inferring and querying upon it. But to make this possible, context and content must be married. And so that's why we're so excited to take the covers off of the vast database. The database is the first database management system that's designed from the ground up for the era of deep learning and deep analytics. Now first, it's really important to understand that unlike other approaches to dealing with big data, the vast database is not a framework that gets layered on some slow object storage, but rather it's a complete end-to-end -end tabular database and meta store that's designed with scalable ACID transactional performance. And then we add in the analytical performance of an exabyte scale NVMe powered data warehouse. And that's all in just one unified database management system. And so the database is basically a continuation of this first principles thinking that we've always had. Let's unify all the different types of database management systems and all the storage tiers together. And what this creates is the first data foundation that allows for real time analysis of streaming data all the way down to the archive. It's really just a faster way to search through tables. It can deliver 100x acceleration for fine-grained queries versus traditional data platforms. And that's all thanks to how we manage the data flow. The day's architecture leverages the right buffer to transact data extremely quickly in record form. But then a background process will transform those records into fine-grained columnar objects that are only 32 kilobytes in size. Now, if you're counting, that's 4,000 times smaller than a standard parquet row group. And so these queries can be incredibly filtered because of this new columnar object that we've developed. I basically describe it as a system that can easily find a needle in a stack of needles. Now the system then builds tables of these columnar objects that can scale to hundreds of billions of rows and trillions of tables where customers no longer need to toil with partition management. Now, of course, it's also built on top of the core enterprise data management capability that we've been building into our platform for years. So out of the box, you get things like 
built-in catalogs for your data, a meta store, audit logs, access policies, as well as multi-site replication, encryption, multi-tenancy, even quality of service. And a nearly unlimited number of consistent snapshots can be taken across all of your tables. And that makes time travel and database cloning really simple. Okay, let's talk about data reduction. VAST's groundbreaking new similarity algorithms are global and they work across all of your tables. But the pattern matching is byte granular. And so we can look beyond noise and data to find new opportunities for data reduction. Now this is a background process that ensures that data engineers essentially don't need to waste their time trying to find that right partition size recipe just to save a few dollars that usually comes at the expense of query engine compression or decompression time. Our new approach is just low cost, scalable, and it's fast. And standards are critical. And so from an access perspective, the VAST database supports standard SQL, but it also can be accelerated using Apache Arrow. And Arrow allows us to use the system to also accelerate other modern query engines, such as Apache Spark, Trino, and Dremio. For selective operations, the system can deliver orders of magnitude faster query response times than some S3 and Parquet-based data lakes. Now, finally, as I mentioned before, the ultimate purpose of the database is really to be a data catalog for training and inferring on unstructured data. And for that reason, each file and each object stored into the VAST data store is then recorded into the VAST database. And that makes it easy to query upon both POSIX and S3 metadata. The entries into the catalog can be enriched by other functions that you can run in the system, basically to create a rich semantic layer upon all of your unstructured data. Now, as we've started to deploy this into production, we're starting to see some really interesting stories, ones that we actually didn't plan on. For example, at Agoda, which is a bookings.com company, we didn't realize the pain associated with managing all the data lake updates and file rewrites that customers need to deal with when they receive a GDPR request. And that's because conventional data lakes aren't really designed for fast depends, and they force you to rewrite whole parquet files, even when just dealing with a small and simple update. Now, in the case of the VAST database, that small atomic columnar object that we created can be easily deleted and can be updated without the need for any complex database cleanup or any database vacuuming. Now, if you think about it, you don't need to worry about partition sizing, appends, compression, or scale. The database just makes analytics easy. Okay, let's talk about brains. We've got this system that provides a consistent, high performance and low cost presentation of your files, your objects, your tables, and your catalogs at a global scale. How can such a system be built to efficiently make sense of this data? And how can it be responsive to data interactions in real time so machines can learn like we learn? Well, this is the idea behind the vast data engine. I'll back up. So for about seven years, we've been building functions on top of the day's architecture. So these are stateless services that are basically triggered by data events that come from the application servers to our storage servers. Or maybe they're triggered by admins and the policies that they might set and change. They might be triggered by the system itself as it deals with failure conditions that need to be recovered from. Now, all of this code until now has been to make storage and database services easy to deploy and fail over. But now it's time to add the last piece of the puzzle. And that's a programmable runtime that moves data through the system to create a looped continuous engine for AI learning. Now this concept of treating code as a new data type in the platform really allows us to turn classical notions of computing essentially upside down. Data shouldn't be driven by applications that work in batch. Applications should be driven by data as it happens within the natural world. And when code then becomes an attribute of the platform, that's when your data becomes animated and dynamic. As Renna mentioned earlier, we're now adding support for two new types of elements that users can now store and execute from the VAST data engine, functions and triggers. At the most basic level, you can think of the VAST data engine as a computer's logic. And in the case of a standard computer operating system, the available resources are basically limited to the memory, the CPU, and the IO facilities that that machine or server might manage. Now, in the case of the data engine, we're basically taking a much broader view of global computing infrastructure. We're able to manage computational resources that span edge, core, and cloud data centers. 
Now, the engine's designed to support popular programming languages such as Python and SQL, and it even has a streaming interface and comes with an event notification system. And so now you can program the environment to execute an entire process of iterative learning in software at a global scale, including the execution of code and even the orchestration of containerized workloads that run in Kubernetes. And then things started to get interesting as we began to understand the complexity of building deep learning training environments. What we realized is that there could be a simpler approach to managing data when it comes to building training applications. And for that reason, we're also introducing a new data representation, one that marries all the great components of our system, the data store, the database, and the data engine. This new data representation combines collections of deep learning training examples, not as data copies, but just as pointers to data that lives on flash infrastructure, and then combines that with indexed metadata, combines that with your model training code, and puts it all into one materialized data view of AI training data. Now, the cool thing here is that it eliminates data management headaches altogether. It eliminates copies of data training examples that get stored across different AI training records that happen across different training jobs. And with our versioning, this new materialized view of data, metadata, and code provides a simple framework for training model reproducibility. Speaking of code, the engine will also come pre-packaged with functions that we've made to make it easier to build AI training models. We can scrape metadata from popular file headers. You can detect and alert when the platform detects personally identifiable information. It will support simple data augmentations for people that use training data to basically create different versions of data for their training jobs. For example, for computer vision, you can imagine that it's able to call functions that flip, rotate, or blur images. Now, finally, the data engine maintains a database of all the possible infrastructure that it can execute functions across. And that provides the ability to auto-scale applications, not just within a data center, but across the whole data space. But the system is also topographically aware of where the data really lives across the whole vast data space. In essence, it can see through the caching layer. And then, with all this information about compute and data locality, the engine will decide on the best location to run each function according to a user's definition and a policy around what the outcome should be. Basically, it works to either optimize for time or money. Now, depending upon the data size or the processor availability, it may make sense to move the data to the compute if you're optimizing against processor gravity. On the flip side, you might want to bring the compute to the data if you want to optimize for data gravity. Now, if you can think about our approach as introducing a new form of anti-gravity, basically it'll just virtualizes all your CPUs, GPUs, DPUs across a fabric of data centers. Now, in cases where customers have idle compute cycles, the system basically makes it easy to move workloads and data to where the available processing resources are. And so we think about this as something that could hopefully also represent a step function improvement in data center energy efficiency. Now, obviously, we can't do this alone. And we've established deep partnerships that are essential to our strategy. Now, since our inception, we've been honored to partner with world-leading companies to create the best data-centric computing experiences for our customers. The data engine just brings us one step closer to working with the world's leading supplier of AI systems, NVIDIA. Are people becoming obsolete? A giant electronic brain has started cogitating at the University of Pennsylvania. It's made of vacuum tubes like your radio, and it can add up a column of figures a yard long in a second. It's the world's first electronic computer. This is really the iPhone moment of AI. It is going to impact every employee of every company. One way of thinking about the evolution of this industry is to ask oneself, what is a data center five years from now going to look like? It all starts with the most valuable asset every customer has is their data. So how is that data kept and how is it made accessible? The other trend is really the shift towards accelerated computing that allows you to do a lot more computation on the same amount of power and the same amount of data center space. And that's the foundation of the work that NVIDIA and Vast did together to make sure that we have really fast storage that can accompany accelerated computing from NVIDIA. Were you recording on that? Yes. Take one, AV cam, Mark. My name is Manuvir Das. I'm the Vice President of Enterprise Computing at NVIDIA. 
our whole mission and agenda is accelerated computing. If you think about the evolution of computing, it's been interesting the phases it's gone through. Back in the 2000s, there was a realization that the workloads require more and more data. And so we moved into a model of data-centric computing. And then we had the advent of the cloud. It was this great place to find compute, but the storage buffers were basically empty, where people started filling up those storage repositories in the cloud. So we actually went back to a model where we were bringing data to the compute again. And I think now we've come full circle where there's enough data in these locations in the clouds that we can think about bringing compute to the data again. As we now see AI proliferate to enterprise companies, there's much more of an expectation for this platform to be enterprise grade. Of course, you need the right compute, you need the networking, you need the storage, but really, you need the right software stack that is actually optimized hand in hand with the hardware. It's all about the data, and it's about bringing the right compute platform to the data. The team at Vast had a beautiful architecture that can bring these two things together. The thing about AI is it's important to generate a lot of structured data that goes hand in hand with the unstructured data. And so in that regard, I think the work on the vast database really goes a long way. Many of the customers we work with do their AI work in multiple locations. And so I think it's very important to have this sort of hybrid view where as the AI work is being done, the data can be accessed from different locations. The data space work that comes with the vast platform is a real enabler. We have a great partnership with Vast. I remember talking to Renan a few years ago where he drew me this picture of the storage that he wanted to build. I've watched that happen over the last few years and see it go from a bold vision to something that has become very real. And when I talk to him now, I hear him talk about this next vision of building beyond into much more than a storage solution. And I feel the same way. And we're looking forward to working with him and the team. So now I'll turn this over to Andy, who's going to give you a tour of how all of this comes together in our thinking machine. Thanks, Jeff. Now, if you're like me, you don't like only watching lectures on how all these things work. You want to see something in action. So I'm going to show you a demonstration of how to use the Vast Data platform. And in this case, what we've done is built a Smart Cities app, which captures image frames from many cameras in fact, thousands of cameras from hundreds of cities throughout the world. And then we perform inference on the images and trade against them to make the AI model we're using for inference better and better as time goes on. Now, you might ask, what's the point of doing inference on all this data? Well, what we're doing is leveraging AI to identify subjects and patterns in all of this camera footage so that city managers and city planners can make better decisions on how they plan and operate critical infrastructure in their respective cities. Think about use cases such as traffic flow optimization, emergency services dispatch, and more. And we don't just want to isolate our app to one location or geographical area. We want to make sure that each and every city manager and planner gets the benefit from the analysis of all data being captured around the world. The sharing of insights will allow them to collaborate and find the best solutions for tough to tackle issues. But at the same time, we need to respect data sovereignty and keep sensitive information from crossing international boundaries. So how can we make all of this happen? Well, first of all, we collect images at the edge as they come off the cameras. They go into S3 buckets on the Vast Data Store, which provide us a low cost, all flash storage platform that scales to exabytes. And because of that scale, we don't have to worry about making sure to trim down the resolution, prune images based on age or anything like that as the data comes in. And this is important because we want to keep as much as possible for future training. Now, once the data arrives, a trigger that we've configured fires off a function to do inference against it. Not only is the data itself captured and processed, but metadata about each image is also arriving and being processed on the platform. Things like GPS coordinates, camera make and model, image resolution are detected in the image header, scraped, and inserted directly into a table on the vast database. The Vast Database is a fully structured store for structured data on the platform, which supports massive scale, low latency inserts, and deep analytical queries. Imagine a database that can handle millions of inserts per second into tables growing to trillions of records across many thousands of columns. So you could run not only streaming queries against real-time data, 
But at the same time, you could run a query that executes across your entire historical data set. Effectively, a high-speed data lake with full asset compliance across tables at scale. Now, in the past, you would have needed to have separate database, data warehouse, and data lake technologies all stitched together by complex ETL and data movement pipelines, but not anymore. Okay, so we have data, we have metadata, and we have triggers and functions which can be run against both as the data comes in or later based on some future condition. Now, these functions are executed and managed by the VAST data engine, which is a globally distributed compute engine that's based on the VAST data platform. There's tight integration between the engine and the platform, particularly because of something we call the VAST data space. This enables compute jobs and functions to execute where the data is. Let's take a step back for a second. The data space is a global namespace which ties together systems spread throughout the world into a mesh which means that any data ingested into any node anywhere in the mesh will become immediately accessible for users, applications, and functions everywhere. So data that comes into Tokyo is immediately accessible and visible by somebody who's in New York. And it doesn't matter what kind of data it is. It could be an object, like the images coming in off these cameras, or a file. It could be a database record. It could be a function or a piece of application code. This is the first time a platform allows the storing and processing of all types of data, both structured and unstructured, regardless of where and how that data was ingested. Okay, so we ran some inference. Now let's run a natural language search to see what we can find. Let's try and find a gray truck in London. Great, we got some hits. Note that in order to get this result, we queried the inference results across billions of images, and we got a response back in seconds. But it seems like some of the images don't have all of the objects identified in them. For example, we can see in this image that we have people and cars and other items which do not have a bounding box or label. If we look more closely at the metadata for this image, we can see that while the model detected more items, the confidence score for them was low, so it didn't make the cut. After all, we don't want city planners making decisions on low confidence data. This is a limitation of the model being used and we wanna make it better. Luckily, I can simply set up another trigger which queries the database looking for images with low confidence scores and then uses a similarity model against these and other images. This similarity model doesn't care about the actual objects being detected, it's just used to determine how similar those images are. Not the same, mind you, just similar. Now. Once it runs, it determines the score of their similarity, and we can execute another trigger, which feeds that information, along with our original inference model, into a new inference function so we can get better results. But we don't want to just constrain training to the images generated in this one location. What if we could train on all data from around the world? Now, remember a minute ago, I mentioned to you that the vast data space allows for data anywhere in the mesh to be accessed and processed by any function. Let's double click on that for a second. When I have data that lives in say Tokyo and data in London and data in New York, and we wanna run a training job across all of it to improve our model, we don't just wanna move the data between these locations because that would take a lot of time and cost a lot of money. Ideally, we can move the compute to the data. Now good for us, the vast data engine can consult with the vast data space to identify the location where the data has the most gravity and run the compute where it's most efficient. This also helps us ensure that sensitive data does not cross geographical boundaries. As our training job runs, model weights are inserted into the database in a vast database table, which, if you recall, can also be accessible anywhere in the mesh. Model weights consume significantly less space and bandwidth, so it's quite efficient to pass them between functions that reside in different geographical locations. Simply put, Shipping just the metadata output is a lot cheaper and faster than shipping all of the source data. Also, by sending only the metadata, it ensures that we do not violate global policies about sharing actual data. Finally, we have another trigger, which automatically reruns inference against the images that have a low confidence score. And voila! We now have images which are much more richly annotated. Now I know I went really fast to this demo and all the components that make it up, so if you want to get more details on how we built this, 
I invite you to watch our explainer video where I'm joined by Alon Harev, Vast VP of Technology, where we take you through more of the technical details. You can also check out our other explainer videos in this series to get more in-depth content on each component of the Vast data platform. Thank you. Large language models allow us to teach computers all the knowledge we've accumulated by giving them access to the internet and the ability to parse natural language. In turn, they parrot that knowledge back to us. Discovery is about creating new understandings. For computers to be able to make that leap, we must give them direct access to the natural world through the vast data space so they don't rely on slow and inaccurate human translators. An ability to store immense amounts of natural, unstructured data in an accessible manner through the vast data store. The ability to transform unstructured, raw data into an understanding of its underlying characteristics through the vast data engine. And finally, a way to build this corpus of knowledge, query it, and generate a better understanding of it through the vast database. Once we do all that, computers will no longer just be tools to assist us in storing and organizing information like they did in the past, nor will they just serve as instruments that learn from us like they are starting to do today. They will instead lean on direct interaction with nature and with each other to formulate new theories and to teach us new ideas. We would love to partner with you on our collective journey to build beyond, leveraging the vast data platform. Even though I often warn about risks with AI, I think it's crucial to also remember the huge upside. Everything I love about civilization is the product of human intelligence. So if we can amplify that with AI and thereby solve all of the problems that have stumped us so far, from curing diseases to eliminating poverty and stabilizing our climate and maybe even helping life spread into our beautiful cosmos, you know, that is incredibly inspiring. And the reason I personally spend a lot of time on working on safety is not because I'm all doomy and gloomy, but it's because I don't want to squander this amazing opportunity we have. It's going to create an awesome future.